Your Partner in Success Radio is a free business podcast with host Denise Griffiths. It's all about great stories, conversation, and context to help you move your business and life forward with actionable tips and advice from her guest experts. To listen and subscribe, just find us on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you consume your podcasts. Good morning and welcome to your partner in Success Radio, where top performers share their secrets to help you achieve your personal and professional goals. I'm your host, Denise Griffiths, and together, along with my truly incredible guests, we bring you inspiring and actionable insights to take your life and your business to the next level. Ranked in the top 2% globally, this podcast really is a must listen, and it is all because of my guests. So let's dive in. So today I welcome to the show Sage Thacker, and she is talking with us today about transforming workplaces with dignity and respect. And she is a TEDx speaker and a chief civility officer. And we're going to talk about that. Those are some big titles. So in the pursuit of a world where everyone is treated with dignity and respect, she emerges as a driving force, a former employment law attorney, a two-time TEDx speaker, and the founder chief civility officer at Train Extra. And I'm going to spell that for you. T R A I N. X big X tra X tra X T R A. Sejal dedicates her expertise to empower leaders in fostering positive, safe, and respectful workplaces. That's so important. It, it just seems to me that we are losing respect everywhere. So at her company, which is a woman minority owned training consulting firm, she provides customized training and coaching, shaping leaders to create environments where employees thrive. And her commitment extends, extends to Nobody Studios, where she serves as the chief culture officer for the venture capital firm, aspiring to nurture 100 compelling companies from ideation to full scale validation. And see, Giles role at Nobody Studios is pivotal. She is instrumental in cultivating a people-first culture, ensuring that each company under their umbrella prioritizes the well-being and the growth of its workforce. Good morning, Sajal. Welcome to your Partner in Success Radio. We had the best pre-interview, and I've really been looking forward to having you here today. Oh, thank you so much, Denise, for that warm welcome. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Oh, you and me both. I listen, I took big notes, copious notes. I think I cried a little bit. I'm not <laughs> sure. I remember telling you just now in the virtual green room that and you mentioned at first that we really should have just recorded that pre interview. It was <laughs> there was so much going on in there. And really what I would love for you to do is tell our audience your story because it's it's fascinating. It's not something that we come across as Americans that we come across often, I don't think. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, no, Denise, thank you. I, you know, I, I, my journey has definitely been filled with some, you know, um, just diversity of all types, you know, and so I, I, as you mentioned in the intro, you know, my background really what what defines me today goes all the way back to the beginning, you know, um, and so I'll just start from the beginning and we can just kind of work to the present because I think setting that context for people so that they can understand the lens through which I do my work is really important, you know, and so you know, I, I, as you, I, I went to undergraduate school in, in Illinois and law school, and then I moved out to California in 2000. And since then, I primarily have represented management in employment law cases for about, about the first 11, 12 years of my legal career. And what happened was that I, I really started to find myself conflicted when I was dealing with some of these cases, because the twist in my story is that I was representing management in cases of harassment, discrimination, bullying. And if anybody knows my back history of what I've gone through in my childhood, they would have assumed that I would have been representing the person who had been discriminated, the, you know, the one that was bullied, the victim. And I actually ended up doing the exact opposite. And so that we can talk a little bit more about, but really I, I think about that journey, that part of my journey, and what that did was it allowed me to see another side of 
a topic that I really want to dig into with you today is this idea of unconscious bias. And so we can go further back into my story as we get into this conversation, but that's really where my, I would say the pivot came in my life is where I started seeing this um, lack of awareness or ignorance or just education on this very important topic of unconscious bias. And that's what led to my first and second TEDx talk and, and so on. So I don't know if that, that gets us started on, on the, the, you know, the direction that you wanted to go with the show, but I'll just stop there and then we can go from there. Whatever you want to talk about is fine with me. And your childhood, I think, is a critical piece of information that our audience needs to to know a bit about. Yeah. And so, you know, my parents moved here. Uh, I'm the daughter of immigrant parents. And my parents moved to the United States in the 70s. And so growing up for me was really, you know, a, a mix of two worlds. You know, my my parents were as traditional as you can get, you know, in the home. And so they just moved here from India. They barely spoke English. Like most immigrants, they started working right away. Um, and, you know, they, they were doing what they could to build a new life for their family. And then as I was growing up, you know, I, 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 I had to reconcile sort of the American culture that existed outside of our home to my parents and their expectations. And so, you know, it was an, it was an ongoing struggle, but it was, it was this duality that really helped me see things from different perspectives. And so, you know, when we look back in our journey and we don't really realize like some of the skills that we do now that we started doing these a long time ago, you know, so things like, my parents were, you know, closed minded and very traditional. So communicating with them to help them reconcile the expectations of the American culture and interpreting the American culture for them and explaining to them and advocating for the American culture. All those things started very young when I was very young in my journey. And I, I even remember my dad at one point, we had a conversation at a dinner table. My dad actually had started law school when he was in India but he never got to finish it. And there was this conversation we had at the dinner table one time where he's like, man, you ask a lot of questions. Sounds like you're going to be a lawyer, you know? And, and so asking questions and explaining and advocating, these were all things I started doing very young. And I knew that I was going to go to law school. It was just something I knew that I had to get to undergraduate school and, and start law school right away. Um, I'll add one other piece to that background story, Denise. Um, so while I was dealing with sort of the duality of the Indian and American culture, you know, I my, at some point um, my parents moved to a predominant a suburb in Chicago, which was predominantly Italian families. And we were the only Indian family in that, you know, in that neighborhood. And so it was it was definitely, a, a, you know, the kids were, you know, kids can be cruel, as we all know. And I experienced that bullying and harassment throughout my elementary, my high school years. And so that as well as the duality of my, between the two cultures really was something where I was like, I wanna to go to law school so I can really help to advocate for these issues, you know? And so that was something that I, I knew that I wanted to do probably when I was, I would say around 11 or 12, I started saying I was gonna to go to law school, right? I knew pretty early on that that's what I wanted to do. Well, and that makes sense and you did it. Which, you know, listen, when I was about that age, I wanted to be an archaeologist. Not sure why I hate sand under my fingernails. <laughs> I wanted to go look at them And, you know, I don't really like digging in the gardens. So, but I was going to be an archaeologist and then I was going to be a nurse, but blood, no thanks. Didn't manage any of those. But, you know, what we want when we're children rarely becomes what we grow up to be, but you did it. Yeah, it was, it, you know, I just knew I social justice was something that was just, I, I wanted to help people see beyond their own lenses from a very early age. I mean, again, when I look back at my, my journey, it, you know, seventh or eighth grade is where I, when I was being harassed and bullied, you know, I started acting out a lot. Um, okay. And I had a lot of anger, a lot of, you know, I talk about that in my first TEDx talks, you know, we, we dealt with some 
you know, really hurtful stuff back then. And I just realized I was going down a bad path. Like, you know, at that rate, I was going to end up in jail. You know, it wasn't looking good. Let's just put it that way. And, and my father, you know, this is, this is the other reason why I, I did that first TEDx talk was because, you know, I didn't, we didn't have a lot of support. We didn't have a lot of resources. There was really no one to talk to about what you were sort of going through you know, and especially as immigrant parents, right? So, you know, you can't talk to the people at home because they don't get it. You know, you can't talk to anybody outside the home. So I really wanted to help raise awareness on that issue of we need to do more to support all children, right? But really realize that there are differences between immigrant children and children that are born here, you know, or that like I was born here, but my parents were immigrants. So the resources are just very scarce. And so these children, you know, and, and again, this extends to all children, because even when I think about my own son here, I'm like, I wish there was more support for him and resources for him. But to, to raise that awareness that these children are just left on their own to, to figure this out. And, and it really has impacts for a long time. You know, it, that pain that, we, the, that people experience when they're going through this. And, and not having the proper support and resources, it comes back and it stays with us for a long time. And for me, that pain stayed with me until my son was born. And, and I talk about that in my second TEDx talk on belonging, right, where and we could talk about that in a little bit, too. But but yeah, it, it, it's really it was something that I knew I was going to be doing. And so after I graduated from law school, I just it just landed in my plate of being in the employment law area. And I, I got a, I got a job right when I was studying for the bar exam. And that's where I really realized where I want to I want to help create better workplace environments, because now I was dealing with discrimination, harassment cases in the workplace. And I'm like, you know, this is a small enough universe where I can actually make a difference. I mean, I wish I can. I, I want I want to create, you know, my mission is to try to create better environments where there's dignity and respect for all. And so I chose to focus on in on the employment law arena. And it was a wonderful experience, but then I started having this conflict. I knew it wasn't the perfect fit yet for what I wanted to do because when I encountered cases where employees were treated unfairly, you know, I found myself conflicted. I, 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 I really wanted the situation to be addressed properly, proactively. And so this realization that employers were not doing what they could to create better workplace environments, I saw a lot of areas where there was a lack of education on topics, you know, and there, there, there wasn't this sort of holistic plan to address some of these issues where they, you know, if we train people better, if we did better investigations, if we were more proactive versus reactive, I just saw a lot of places where I can make a better uh, impact. And so that's the realization where I said, okay, I, I don't want to just come in as a compliance person, as someone who's here to, you know, defend the claim, um, I want to educate. And so that's where my passion for education really kind of came to light after my son was born. And then I, I started training and educating and, and consulting with employers on these topics as a, kind of a side hustle at the beginning. And then in 2017 is where I took that big step and started my company of Train Extra, where you know, I, I work with companies all over the globe on helping to build those positive, safe and respectful workplaces and primarily focusing in on pro by providing training programs. And so that was really, you know, it, it, it wasn't an easy sort of I knew I knew I wanted to go to law school. But then from there, it, I had to, it took me some time to really figure out what my sweet spot is. Well, that makes sense. And when you're talking about topics and I just wrote that down. What kind of topics were you seeing that just weren't being addressed and that you're now working with with your consulting firm? Because, listen, I don't work for anybody but me. I, I'm unemployable. I run with scissors and I don't play well with others, so I have to be my own boss. That's just all there is to it. But I do come across a lot of people who are just saying, I don't know what the heck is going on, but nobody hears me. Nobody listens to me. Yeah. And, 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 and you make a perfect, and that that's a perfect, um, you know, point that you just made. Um, you know, when I first started doing the training piece, I started off doing 
uh, the, you know, your anti-harassment compliance training, because that was a natural transition as an employment law attorney. I was like, okay, I've been doing this. I can continue to do that. And I still offer anti-harassment training, but I just felt like it wasn't comprehensive enough. You know, it's like you go to one of those trainings and you learn what the law is and you learn the definitions and then you learn, you know, here's what you should do. And in most cases, what you're told is report it to your supervisor, report it to HR, and then you punt it over to somebody else and hope and that that's they take why, care of it. Right. That's <laughs> why you hear nobody hears me. Nothing's happening. Exactly. Next. Exactly. And and then, you know, and that, that, that there was just, it, of course, that isn't working. That hasn't worked. And that's why we have so many harassment cases. And, and, and so what we were, what, what were the law, put into place this training. It was a mandated training, but it wasn't comprehensive enough, right? There was lots of areas that weren't being covered because like, what about things like unprofessional behavior or, you know, um, a microaggression or even workplace bullying, which are not necessarily illegal behaviors, but they happen more frequently. So then people are seeing, you know, watching people doing things that are maybe not illegal, but that's continuing to happen. And unfortunately, I was seeing that behavior happening in leadership a lot more because I was representing managers, right? So I was seeing these cases over and over again. And I'm like, how does this person get away with this for 30 years? Like, what is going on? We've had huge turnovers. The morale has tanked. You've got a toxic work environment. People are gossiping. And yet this one person at the top who is treating everybody this way is getting away with it. And so I was seeing all of these real, you know, examples playing out and I was talking to these managers and I'm like, there is so much more we can do. So that was one area. So then I started doing the diversity and inclusion trainings. Right. And, and there, again, that, uh, that was something I was very passionate about. And I started doing that and I started seeing even gaps in that area. You know, where I was like, okay, first of all, there's no no bridges between the anti-compliance trainings and the diversity inclusion trainings. There were major gaps in the information that was being covered. And we weren't setting, in my opinion, a foundation, you know. And so my whole thing became civility, because from my experience and the work that I've done, if we don't have civility as the foundation, you can't have diversity and inclusion thrive in those environments. Right. So. And the reality is we live in a very now, especially, you know, after the pandemic, we live in a very global world, right? I'm frequently having conversations with people of all different cultures. We know that diversity is something that all organizations want, but we can't get there until we get to this place of civility. And so that's where I feel like I I bridged a lot of those gaps. And really, it's all about empowering people to be a part of that solution. And so part of my civility trainings really go into that topic I mentioned at the very beginning, unconscious bias. And they go into areas that I feel were lacking in some of the other um, trainings that I was doing, for example, bystander intervention. You know, I mean, we can't expect the person who's on the re- on the receiving end of these hurtful comments and behavior to be the one that educates and the one that speaks up all the time. You know, we, we can tell, we can try to encourage that behavior. And if we create an environment of psychological safety, then that person should feel safe in bringing their concerns to their managers, which is what we want. But the reality was very different than that, from what I was observing that employers weren't doing what they needed to do to create those psychologically safe work environments. So what we need to do is really shift the burden to people that are witnessing these behaviors that are happening in the workplace. So so if you see something happening, you have a responsibility to what I like to call in my workshops, call in that person, you know? And so it's about educating that person that, hey, you know, maybe this wasn't your intention, but what you said could be potentially harmful because it's not in line with our organization's values, with the kind of culture that we want here. And so I focus a lot on bystander intervention. And Denise, you know, as I was doing this work, it became very clear that most people, I mean, most people are good people. They're well-intentioned people. 
you know, um, they're not, but they're, they don't have the proper tools or the resources or the script. A lot of people, you know, this is, this is going against how we've been doing it. And so we need to give people a script. We need to give them some tools to empower them. And that's really, really what I do in my workshops now. And see, I love what, yeah, and I wrote this down too, you know, bystander intervention and my brain went instantly to Twitter because I spent a little bit of time over the weekend on Twitter hunting for something. And I kept coming across these horrifying videos of teachers being clobbered by chairs and, you know, kids just beating the ever living snot out of each other. Mm-hmm. While the bystanders were videoing, nobody was saying, hey, <laughs> knock it off. That worries me for the world at large. It's not just our country. It's happening everywhere. Absolutely. That's the huge problem, you know, and, and, and it, it, that that's why I, that a huge component of the work that I do is that, but then there's also like what you're saying is, is it's happening everywhere. It right? is. So it's, it's globally a problem. And that's another reason why I think we need to empower more people to do this work because it's happening everywhere. And until we give people the skills and the tools, and again, it boils down to lack of education, you know, again, like going back to that unconscious yeah, bias fear. conversation. I don't, yes. Isn't fear involved in it because people say, oh, I don't want to get Absolutely. Give, oh, I'm going to get yeah. in trouble. They're going to come after me. Yes. I think we're living, I don't think, I know. Right now, we are living in a very fearful world everywhere. Yes. It's true. And, and I mean, there's so much re- research behind that. I mean, if we just talk about the United States, right, um, we have the, the number one complaint filed, lawsuit filed across the board is retaliation. You're People kidding. are afraid. Well, no. I, yeah, I, I take that back. Years. I'm not, I, you know, I shouldn't have said that. I should have said, <laughs> no kidding. Because once I had a moment to think about it, so, well, duh. Yeah, you're right. Mm-hmm. Number one, and for years now, you know, and, and again, and that, 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 that doesn't really mean much when you think about the fact that three out of four people don't even report harassment, right? So that number isn't, that's not even really representing the amount of retaliation and harassment that's going on out there, right? Because three out of four people are too scared to say something. I mean, when I do my workshop, one of the things I always do in almost every single workshop is to ask people, you know, what are the reasons why people don't speak up? And you just see a list of like 50, 60 responses, but a lot of them deal with, I'm scared Mm -hmm. to say something because Everyone's going to judge me. I'm going to be that one person that uh, the troublemaker. And so we have to now retrain people to say, no, no, no. We actually encourage you to do that because if you don't say something, we can't do something to protect you. But that only works if the the employer does something to protect them. Right. So if, if these are not taken, if people's concerns are not taken genuinely. And they're not responded to in in a you know in a, in a timely and prompt manner. Then none of this works. And so again, it needs to be more than just education. There needs to be accountability. There needs to be a whole plan behind fostering civility. So I I, I talk to HR groups all the time. I talk to leadership groups, and I say, you need to create a civility action plan, which is very different than your diversity plan, your inclusion plan, your other, you know, maybe you have a belonging plan, equity, whatever. This is a whole different area of civility because, you know, if if you can't foster civility, you can't build on top of that. And there's no way that diversity and inclusion or even belonging can happen unless you create that psychologically safe place, right? As you can tell, Denise, super passionate about this topic. (laughs) I just wrote that word down too. And I I had written down civility and then I underlined it because, and it's not just in the workplace, we're, we're getting less and less civil. And just as an example, yesterday I had to call Home Depot again because I made the mistake of buying a mower that is largely a piece of garbage. (laughs) And I've been trying to get them to pick it up and get it taken care of. And it just hasn't happened. So I got an, in a long conversation yesterday with somebody at Home Depot, and now they're going to be here on Wednesday, maybe, to pick it up. But I had this lovely conversation with a girl named Clarissa. And, you know, you could tell she was just, it was early in the morning. She figured I was going to be hysterical. Apparently, she deals with that a lot. And 
at the end of the conversation, she told me your name. She told me she was born in Guam, that she speaks three languages. She could hear my cat. We had a delightful conversation, but it, this is the important part, and it really stuck with me. She said, Miss Denise, you were such a pleasure to speak with today. What is wrong with treating people the way you want to be treated? Mm-hmm. This is what I don't get. Yeah, yeah, it happens far too often. And, 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 you know, look, I started my business in 2017. And I called myself the chief civility officer then, right. And, and we've gone through so many things just in the last few years that have increased in civility in the workplaces, the pandemic, the Black Lives Matter movement, the civil rights movement, politics, we have multi gender. Yeah, we have there. (laughs) <laughs> no, let's not go there. No. Uh, <laughs> and then you have the you have the rapid globalization, right? So because of technology and because people are working from home now, we're interacting with people all over the globe like never before. And we've got multi generational workplaces. So now we've got five different generations working together who all view things like how we communicate, how we um, cultural competence, how do, how do we resolve conflict? All of these things that now have to come together in one environment and collaborate together and innovate together. So whether you like it or not, you're going to have diverse perspectives in your organizations, in your communities, and you need to be able to communicate and and get along and, and be civil with one another, right? Which is either at work or outside of work. Like you said, that was something this woman probably doesn't get treated that way often. That's why she was expressing her gratitude to you. And I catch myself, you know, like I had a similar conversation with somebody because I, uh, you know, I had to get on the phone with um, my internet provider, Microsoft internet provider. And, you know, uh, my computer had gotten some kind of virus and the person speaking to me was just doing their job. And I was, I could feel myself so upset about my situation that I was starting to get short with that person. And I had to reel myself back in to say, Hey, this person is just doing their job. You're dealing with a frustrating situation. It's much easier to say things when you're hiding behind a computer screen or a phone because you're not seeing that person face to face. And we're, you know, life is challenging at times. And so it's if we don't if we don't catch ourselves, if we don't gain that awareness of, okay, I'm responding to my emotions or I'm responding to my hidden biases right now, um, then you're going to you're going to just continue that cycle. And we need to break that cycle. Exactly. And listen, I've. Last week, I was telling you in our virtual green room, last week, and I'm a nerd in stilettos, I'm a techie person, none of my tech wanted to work last week, and I was saying some bad words, I was stomping around, I'm not sure I didn't bite a cat's tail when he got in my way, but this is where I take out my frustration, (laughs) I don't yell at the person, the live person that I finally get to, but if they, you know, they say, oh, this call is being recorded, you know, but where you're pushing one and putting in a they really ought to record those and listen to them because that's where they're going to get an earful of what people think about your company. (laughs) I'm nasty as all get out until I get the live press. I'm hi, how are you? (laughs) (laughs) I've already worked it out. (laughs) Nice. system. It's rude though. (laughs) That's hilarious. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, when you hear me, I'll hear myself going, Oh God, I hope they don't pick up. Oh, Hi, how are you? But let's talk about unconscious bias, because listen, we all have them. We all have them. And we may say, well, I'm not racist. You know, and we hear, well, I'm not racist. Well, what you did just was. But, you know, there's a difference in my view from being part of the whole racism thing that's going on right now and being biased. So let's talk about that a bit. Yeah, I, I, I would love to. And, and you know, um, when I, when I, again, when I look back on my journey of growing up, I wish I would have known how to combat bias better. You know, I, I didn't, when, when those kids were bullying and harassing me, I now understand that they were also ignorant or they had biases or they lacked awareness, right? Because they were a product of their upbringing, just like I'm a product of my upbringing. Right. Yeah. I was to say that's learned in the home. Exactly. Yeah. And, and so I, I wish I would have known that, that there were strategies or tools that could be, you know, that I could challenge their biases better as a child, because again, it starts in the home and then we just, we, it's, it, it's ingrained with us. And, and I love that you said that because look, unconscious bias is normal. It's a normal part of being human. It doesn't mean that we're bad people. It only becomes bad 
right? When we're not aware of it, or, and then we take actions un, unintentionally, like microaggressions, right? And so, so th- what we know is now neuroscience has come a long way, right? And we understand that our brains process so much information in such a short period of time that it creates all these shortcuts. It starts to recognize you see somebody right away, and then you make all these assumptions or judgments about them. And you don't even realize you're doing it. So you're not, it's not that you're doing it intentionally. It's happening unintentionally. It's happening in your brain as a result of how it processes information. And so these judgments or assumptions that we make about people, they can be positive or negative, right? So I use this example all the time is like uh, my son, if anybody knows me, knows that my son is the center of my universe. So if I see somebody walking down the street that looks like my son, it's natural for me to have a favorable disposition towards that person because they remind me of someone that means a lot to me that I love. And so that's an example of a positive hidden bias that might happen, right? Versus an example of a negative one would be, you know, to this day, like I mentioned, I was harassed and, and bullied by Italian kids. So to this day, if I meet someone and they tell me that they're Italian, I notice my hands get a little bit sweaty and my heart starts to beat a little bit fast. And it has nothing to do with this person, but that's because I of what I went through in my childhood, right? And so now I have this negative bias against this person. And so some of these can be conscious, right? And some of these biases are hidden from us. They were just because of our lived experiences of what we've gone through in our lives, how we view the world because of our own experiences. And so they're hidden from us. And so that's what I learned about, you know, when I started working for University of, of um, San Francisco and, 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 and before I started my business, I went back to work for UCSF Medical Center. And that's really what I got exposed to the science behind unconscious bias. And again, this was way into my legal career. And so when I started learning about this, it really frustrated me that A, I hadn't known about it before. And here I am a lawyer, you know, interacting with people, making decisions. And I haven't been taught this stuff. Luckily, I had developed my own strategies as I was dealing with that in my career, in my life. And when I started learning the science behind it, I'm like, this is exactly what people need to understand that when we in, when we have these hidden biases, which are, again, normal, it doesn't mean that we're bad people. It just means that we have to understand that we're all susceptible to it and that we all have to do the work to recognize what our own hidden biases are and or conscious biases. Right? We have to recognize what they are, our biases, and then realize that our unconscious biases impact literally almost every single decision that we make. And so we need to understand what are the things that we're, what are the things that are impacting the decisions that we're making, the important decisions that we're making and the people that we love in our lives, right? And so there are, there are some tools and that's the good news. And this is why I, I do a lot of work in this area is that if we, I think most people want to create those environments of inclusion and belonging, but we can't get there until everybody does their own work to recognize what their hidden biases are. And then we have to empower people with those tools. So the good news is there's tools that people can use to start to learn about their own biases, because my biases are going to be very different than yours, Denise, right? So we've had different, we've had different lived experiences. And so our biases are going to be different from each other. And so I have to do my work just like you would have to do your work to figure what those out are, because then once you know what they are, then there are strategies that you can put into place to help you mitigate the impacts of those biases, which are impacting your decisions. Right. Yes, absolutely. And listen, I come across my own biases every once in a while. And you know why? Because I'll keep repeating the same thing over and over again and go, hang on, Denise, take a seat. And I'll have to examine it and go, what in the heck are you thinking? Mm-hmm. Where did this come from? Why are you being such a little snot? I do that a lot. <laughs> I'm pretty yeah. sure I'm still the same 15 year old sociopath that I always was. I'm not sure we ever grow out of that. But, you know, it's just, you have to be aware. And when you catch yourself traveling that same road over and over again, and again, that's, you know, those neural pathways, 
it's time to pave over it and maybe take a left or a right or climb up a tree, do something different. But let's talk about those those tools and those strategies. Yeah. So, you know, as, as far as learning about what your hidden biases are, right? So I, there is an online tool that you can look up, at, you know, just if you go into Google and you type in the implicit association test, um, that's one tool that's accessible to everybody. It's free, so you don't have to pay for it. It was a, it's a, it's an online, I don't like calling it a test. It's more, it's a tool, right? It's a tool to help you figure out what your natural tendencies are, your hidden biases. And so this, this tool was developed as a result of a collaboration amongst psychologists from Harvard, University of Virginia, University of Washington. And it's really designed to help people who take this tool to recognize what their unconscious biases are, right? It was launched, I think, in 1998, and millions of people have taken it. So it's broken out into different sections, and you do this association. So they show you a picture, and, or they show you a word, or whatever, and then you pick the association right away without thinking about it, right? Because you want to test your unconscious biases, and unconscious biases are really they happen in the blink of an eye. So you're not sitting there thinking it through. You just have to press one button right away. So it takes all these associations that we make based on images and things that we see. And then it tells you that, hey, in these situations, and so like age, gender, nationality, religion, sexual orientation, there's, I think the last time I checked, there was like 14 different sections that you can take. And so it just gives you information so that you can be aware of, oh, wow, I didn't know that. Like I, when I, when I took it, I learned so much about myself that I was like, I had no idea that I had this hidden bias. Right. So you learn, you learn that about yourself. And again, it does not mean that you're a bad person. It just means that because of your life and because of the things you've gone through somewhere along the way, some information, put that information into your mind. And now that's there and it doesn't come out until you're faced with that situation. Like you said, you catch yourself, right? And you're like, what are you doing? Why am I even thinking this way? That's not who I am. And that's the whole point of this is that a lot of times our hidden biases are actually the opposite, the exact opposite of who we are today or what our current belief system is. But they're they're clinging on, aren't they? Exactly, exactly. Like the example of the Italian person. I know now that not, no, that this person has nothing to do with that person, you know, but it's clinging on. So in that moment, I have to stop. And then that's where, you know, because I know that bias, I'm aware of it. So that's when you can start putting into those strategies into place. So the implicit association testing is, is a great tool. But here's another one. Right. Here's the thing about our unconscious biases. Right. It's not obvious to us. We're, we're not aware of what that bias might be, but it comes out in the words, in our actions, in our behaviors, in the way we treat other people, in the decisions that we make. So I always tell people, you know, ask someone that you love, that you know will be honest with you, right? And when I say ask somebody, I'm not talking about that one person that's going to tell you what you want to hear, because that doesn't help us grow. <laughs> that's not going to be the person I'm talking about. I'm talking about the person who's going to be brutally honest with you, you know, and say, hey, someone that you spend a lot of time with, say, hey, do you, know, do you notice when I make these kinds of decisions? Like, do you think I'm biased in any way? Right. And I would say, just be ready for the, for the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Don't have a hanky, have a towel. because <laughs> You're going to need it. Exactly. Right. Because we all do it. It's normal. I mean, I do this work for a living. And sometimes I say something and I'm like, oh, my, why did I just say that? Right. Because it's just it's normal. And so as we do this work, you know, I, I, I really come at it from a very positive sort of let's give each other grace way, you know, because it's hard. It's hard to recognize that sometimes we say and do things not because we're bad people, because we just do. And we need to correct that and that we can't correct it. You know, it's, it's really is really is up to us to do that. And so then so there's two tools right there that can help you. Right. And then the third one, 
I'll just share this other one. I feel like I'm giving one of my workshops right now, but Hey, you know, I've got this, I've got the mic right now, Denise. I'm just going to give it to everybody right now. I told you in the beginning, you talk about whatever you want because (laughs) I'm not going to get in your way. Yeah. Um, But you know, the third one is look, just, I, I, I talk about this in my, um, my first TEDx talk, right. About um, the hat framework. Right. So I, I use the I love hats. And so I use the term H-A-T. So the H is for hold off. Right. So when you are the way that you could start to recognize your bias is like that moment that you have where you just describe where you stop yourself and you say, wait a second. And you question, why am I having this reaction? So whenever you meet somebody and you have a whether it's a really strong positive reaction or a really strong negative reaction towards somebody that you meet or that you're interacting with, right? Stop and ask yourself that question. You know, and why am I feeling this way? Why am I reacting this? Why am I I just met this person? Or I, even if it's someone that you interact with regularly, if they're different than you, you know, because these are automatic assumptions that we're making. And so look for objective facts. Right. To, and rather than just relying on your preconceived notions. And so that's the H. It's hold off whenever you're having that strong, positive or negative reaction. And then ask yourself why, you know, why am I reacting? And then T is for take action. And I love that you said that at the beginning, Denise, because you said, you know, why is it so difficult to treat people in the way that you want to be treated? And so what I talk about as far as the T in my TEDx talk is I say, yeah, the golden rule is great. We should all do that. But I take it a step further and say, I'm out there advocating that we should all be also adding on to that golden rule, the platinum rule, right? Which is we want to treat people how they want to be treated, right? So in order for you to treat somebody, so if you you were going to interact with me and you want to treat me the way I want to be treated, Denise, guess what you'd have to do? You'd have to get to know me. You'd have to make time to be present, to connect with me to understand who I am. And that's the only way that you could treat me how I want to be treated. And that's really what it boils down to, right? We're going to be dealing with people who are different than us. And so we need to make the time to figure out how they view the world and how they want to be treated. And that's the spirit of sort of the empathy and understanding that we need to foster these cultures of civility, which again, goes very opposite to the hustle culture that we live in. Go, 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 go. We don't have time. I've got a hundred emails. When, by the time I finish this one hour conversation with Denise, I'm going to respond to 50 things here and there. How am I going to get to connect with every single person that I'm interacting with? Well, that's what it takes. That's really what it takes if we want to create more understanding, more acceptance, more, we can't just keep tolerating people, right? We have to move beyond that. And that, that understanding only happens when we do this work to unroot our unconscious biases, where we start putting into strategies to, you know, um, create those cultures of civility. And then we can go into belonging after we get there, right? So. Right. And I'm so glad you brought up empathy because I had actually just written that down because what you're talking about and and what I'm hearing is that unless you are willing to sit down with yourself and give yourself some empathy and do some work on yourself, Mm -hmm. look, I had, you're just not going to get anywhere. You're not going to be able to help other people unless you're willing to sit down, shut up and listen. That's Mm -hmm. what I do on this podcast. I try. I just lied. I try to sit down, shut up and listen, but sometimes it doesn't work out that way. But, but the thing is, we have to have empathy and we have to have critical thinking. And listen, there are going to be people that you just don't like. Maybe it's their aura. Maybe that you're picking up something in them that you really don't want anything to do. And I think that's okay. And I don't often come across somebody. I really can't stomach them but I'm smart enough to get the heck away from them. Absolutely. And and that, and that's, that's really the underlying, you just, I love how you put it, right? Because look, we're not, we, we, we don't have to be best friends with every yeah. single person that comes into our life, but we still have to be civil to them, right? And so this whole, what you said, everything, self-reflection, examine your own behaviors, you have empathy for yourself, understand that, you know, you're responsible for educating yourself and listen, like you said, listen and emphasize. I love all of that. And then I'm just going to add on to what you said, though. It doesn't doesn't stop there. 
You know, we need more. We need people to speak up more. So when you witness incivility, when you witness bias, when you witness things happening, discrimination, you know, it's happening to other people, don't hesitate to speak up. You know, you don't have to make a big deal out of it. Right. But if you don't speak up, that behavior continues and it perpetuates. And that's what turns into the systemic bias that we see in organizations, in our communities, in our laws. Right. And so and then the other thing is not only speak up, but but learn how to be an ally for other people. You know, allyship is critical and we can all do more. Now, al being an ally could mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So I'm not saying everybody needs to go stand and march around the Capitol. I'm not saying that, you know, people just assume that it's do what feels comfortable for you. Right. Think about maybe you have a privilege that you can use to amplify voices of marginalized individuals. Maybe you can advocate and, and for a policy that fosters inclusion. Maybe you can challenge a discriminatory practice or something. You have to decide what's right for you, but do something if you truly want to be a part of this change, right? And which I think most of us do. Nobody wants to go, like if I'm talking about work, nobody wants to go to work and deal with harassment, discrimination, uncivil behavior. We go to work because we, most of us like the people we work with, right? We were part of a team. We want to do something. It becomes a part of our lives, a big part of our lives. And so, but that means that we all need to do more, right? And so this is why this conversation, again, Denise, thank you so much for inviting me and giving me space to be able to share some of this information because that's really what the work I do is, is I really want to just empower people so that they can do more in the spaces that they exist in. And it is important what we're talking about. And you mentioned tolerating a couple of times. And I wrote that down too. You had to see my notebook. You know, the really important stuff is underlined. I've got a little, few little stars here. Empathy was one of them. But tolerate. And I inst when you've said that the first time, I instantly went back to a very early business coach of mine who was listening to me. And I suspect I was just winding up a storm. I don't remember now. It was a long time ago. But she was very quiet. And she said, Denise, I said, yes, ma'am, because I knew I was about to get it. I just knew I could tell by the tone of her voice. And she said, what are you tolerating in yourself? Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something. I was getting ready to go on a road trip from here where I lived <clears throat> to Atlanta, Georgia, 10 hours in the car. And, you know, I wasn't driving. I was with a friend of mine. She was driving. And I remember having a big conversation with her because that stuck with me mm -hmm. so long. And so this was years ago. It still stuck with me. And every once in a while, I have to sit back and say, what are you tolerating, Denise? Mm -hmm. That again? Really? And then I off I go. So, you yes. know, it's, it's, my point is you can't. You shouldn't tolerate in others what you're tolerating in yourself is my point. But you also have to stay on top of what you're tolerating or not mm. tolerating. It's not a one and done. So, oh, I'm not going to do that it. anymore. Baloney. You're going to do it tomorrow at noon. I'm going to start asking myself that. Thank you. That, that's that's a great way. Yeah. Like, why oh, am I tolerating? Said, what am I tolerating? Yeah. Why am I tolerating it? And it's part of my... I ask myself all the time, but you know what I'm finding? I think I just mentioned it. I'm still tolerating the same old crap. Mm -hmm. It sneaks yes. back in. Yes. Yes. But every time you ask yourself that question and you get that awareness, it, it's, it's the retraining of our minds, right? It's, we have to retrain our minds. Um, and, and, and I, I love that. It's, it's some, it reminded me of, of, of a, a quote that somebody else said on a podcast that I did where they said, what you accept, you expect, right? So yeah. Yeah. If, if, if I'm going to tolerate certain kinds of behaviors, I'm going to get more of it. Of course you are. And you're yeah. probably going to pay it back, which That's is right. good. So, Or pay it forward, <laughs> which isn't good either. <laughs> exactly. So we have to be aware of our own biases, you know, conscious or unconscious, and work on them. You know, look, I've got some biases that I think are pretty darn nifty. I work on those. I've got some that I'm getting pretty darn sick of. I'm working on those. Well, Denise, you're talking about conscious biases, right? I mean, yeah. just, if, when we talk about unconscious biases, there are social biases like gender, for example, that are built in to our communities, right? So those are inherently built in 
to that we're all victims of. None of us can escape some of the like gender just comes to mind, right? Of, of the gender ty- typical stereotypes that we hear. You know, for example, like me as a woman, you know, as a as a, a minority woman, you know, I could tell you at least thirty times in my career where somebody said to me, "Oh, you don't look like a lawyer." <laughs> I'm like, okay, great. <laughs> That's I'll use that to my advantage, right? Because there is this notion of gender and or or, co- or person of color and what success as an as, as a lawyer looks like or what norms of success in our communities look like. Those are baked into our cultures that we they're deeply ingrained. And then there's cognitive biases, and there is over 180 cognitive biases, mental shortcuts that everybody's brain takes that have been identified and who knows how many more there are than that, right? So these are hidden biases, it, you know, when we, so that's, I just wanted to make that distinction that we were, you know, it's like breaking a bad habit until you know about it, you can't break it. Well, and I wanted to mention that earlier when you're talking about basically this, but we don't know what we don't know. You know, when you're talking mm-hmm. about somebody step up and say something or, you know, help out or do something. But when, when you see something happening, a lot of times the person doesn't know what they're, why they're doing it or that they even did it. We, mm-hmm. don't, we don't know. That's right. That's and scary. and that, that it's super scary. And that's why we have to, add, that's why I'm, I'm always encouraging and inviting people to do more call ins. Right. So that, to, that's to let that person to. know. And I mean, I think we both would agree on this, right? Like if I'm saying something that's offending people and I'm doing it, not, I'm not intending to harm people, but it's harming people. I don't know about you, but I would want to know about that so I can change my behavior. I don't want to, I don't want to make people feel uncomfortable around me. I want people to be comfortable around me. So if I'm saying something and, and it makes people like, for example, I was, I, I, I use this example in my trainings, right? Like I, I, I'm, I'm giving you background on it, but doesn't justify the behavior. I was born and raised in Chicago. And we say, you guys, I said, you guys growing up, you know, this was like something that just built into my vocabulary. And I know there's a hundred reasons why I shouldn't use that term, you guys, when I'm referring to an audience of men and women. I know that it could make the women feel uncomfortable. And there's lots of reasons why I shouldn't be using that. But occasionally it slips out. And so I catch myself right away and I'm like, whoa. OK, you know, you, you can't you can't say that, you know. And so I actually had a woman call me in one time when I when I slipped up and she came to me after the workshop and she said, hey, you know, I know you didn't intend this, but it made me feel uncomfortable when you referenced everybody. As you. And I was like, you're, I'm so sorry. You're right. I didn't catch myself and I, I won't I'll do my best to not have that happen again. Thank you so much for bringing this to my attention. Right. Because I didn't even realize it just slipped out. And so it's, if we do these call ins for each other, I tell people, view it like a gift, because in that moment, it might not feel good. In that moment, you might be thinking, oh, my what? She, I gave all this information. You know, your ego starts to get in the way or you get defensive just as a normal survival mechanism. This person's attacking me. And so I need to protect myself, defend myself. But we need to get past that and say, this is a gift because She's letting me, she's giving me some feedback and I can improve because of this feedback. And, and when we start viewing it as a gift, when someone is calling us in, it just becomes easier to embrace that and, and to, to break that bad habit, right? Or that bias right. that you might have. And that does make sense. Now that wouldn't have offended me at all, but I say y'all a lot. So <laughs> there's that, but I wanted to go back to, empathy and what we're talking about here is when you catch yourself doing something listen I know almost instantly maybe it's because I'm self-aware to some degree but I almost know when I've actually accidentally said something that might be a little bit off or a little bit offensive and I'll think about it and then I'll pick up the phone and call and say I'm so sorry that's not you know I hope I didn't offend you I didn't mean to this is what I was really trying to say because sometimes you just your mouth, but mouth open, brain not engaged happens all the time. But you have to be aware enough to go, I don't think that landed right. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll comment on that because I think we can pay more attention and be more aware to people's reactions and not just their words, right? So some I've heard this over and over again where a supervisor will be like, well, this person never told me 
that this comment made them feel uncomfortable. Like had they told me, I would have never made that comment or I would have stopped making that comment, right? So I hear that a lot. Um, but I, I think that there's things that we, you know, we can, we need to pay more attention to nonverbal communication. So if you said something, and like you said, you could pick up on if someone stopped making eye contact, they stop smiling, or they pick up their cell phone, they start texting, and they're not, you know, they're not, they're trying to avoid you, or they try to, you know, they limit their contact with you. There are things that the signals, choices of behaviors that people engage in, that let us know right away, also micro expressions on their face, right? So when you're, when you say something that's hurting that person, it registers with the brain and without you even being aware, there's going to be some facial expression, a micro, it happens really quickly, but you can start picking up on those. So I absolutely agree with you on, you know, there are instances where we can tell right away if we're, um, we're impacting other people. And, and I think we can all be more aware on that. The only one, one, sort of exception, that exception that I would point out is microaggressions, right? So when microaggressions happen, these are these subtle behaviors, they're, you know, part of everyday daily conversations, they come from these hidden biases that are ingrained in our culture, that have some sort of convey a derogatory or prejudiced attitude towards a person of a marginalized group. And so these happen so frequently, and they're so kind of built in that they're almost normal to how we communicate with people that you might not be able to pick up on that reaction because the person maybe has just gotten used to it. They've heard it so often that they think it's normal, but it still causes them a lot of harm. Right. So um, so that so those require us to be more of that. And we need to intervene in those situations. Right. Where. If it makes us feel uncomfortable, even if we can't pick up on the fact that it made this other person feel uncomfortable, or we're not able to see anything physically or any any signs that this person is harmed by it, but if it makes us feel uncomfortable, or or you know our sort of intuition says, uh, I don't know, this could possibly be making that, we need to get more in tune with that. And so what I encourage people to do is to check in with that person, right? To check in with that person to say, hey. You know, I thought this this comment was not in line with our culture. And, you know, but I just want to check in with you. Is it something that's harmful to you? Is it something we need to deal with? Right. And because you don't want to say something or report something or bring up a concern unless it makes you feel uncomfortable. But we don't want to speak for other people either. Right. So we want to make sure that we're not taking away power from anybody that is already feeling, imp you know, like they, they have a lack of control or power in their lives. So that's the only other thing I would sort of mention. Thank you. Listen, Sejo, I really appreciate your company today. And remember, I told you this is the fastest hour on the internet, and we are just about out of time. And spending this time with you has been a genuine pleasure and so enlightening. Before I let you go, would you mind sharing some last thoughts, and then tell people how to find you online? Thank you so much, Denise, for inviting me. I knew we were going to have an incredible conversation. I, I really enjoyed the opportunity to share information. I would just tell people, look, you know, there's so much information available. You know, you can follow me on LinkedIn. You can um, look at, I put I post resources on my website at trainextra.com. I'm always posting on LinkedIn and providing resources on these topics of civility, of unconscious bias, microaggressions, any of the topics that we've talked about today. You can, I'm always, you know, I think that, that we need to just start to educate people more and raise awareness on these topics and what we can do to, to empower ourselves. So don't hesitate to reach out to me if there's you know, you need assistance with any of these topics that I'm talking about, or you just need point a, a pointer to guide you in the right direction. I'm happy to assist. Thank you. Well, listen, as we, and by the way, I am, I just wrote this down again. I am going to head over and find the uh, implicit association tool. You're going to get an email from me, probably a wet, damp email. I didn't know this about myself. <laughs> Perfect. Yes, that would prepared. be awesome. Be prepared. Be prepared. Yeah. <laughs> Goodness only knows what's going to happen. But uh, And I also wrote down, this is going to be like a multiple choice test. I can tell it already. So I'll let you know what happens. But listen, everybody, as we wrap up today's episode, I kindly ask you for your valuable feedback. And if you found our insights 
helpful and you enjoyed the show, I would greatly appreciate your support by leaving a review and a rating on iTunes. Your feedback is crucial in my mission to inspire and empower more individuals on their path to success. So don't forget to hit that subscribe button, leave a review, and share your part in success radio with your friends and colleagues. And be sure to join Sajal Thacker on her in her journey to transform workplaces into bastions of dignity and respect and setting a new standard for leadership and inclusivity. Thank you so much. I really appreciate, <clears throat> excuse me, I really appreciate you being here with me today. Get your voice heard. If you would like to launch your own far-reaching podcast, contact Denise Griffiths at yourofficeontheweb.com and go to the podcast tab.